coming to some kind of, of decision about his responsibility, about what we talked about at the beginning of this, that, that these, there are things that don't go away from the war and that, that there's um, an obligation you have to do something with your life. So there's this connection he's made between this runaway girl and his memories of, of things he'd seen in the war and she threading all that together. And uh, this, this takes place at the uh, Bridge to Solomon's Island. The day turned cold, too cold for November. Winter's first breath. That noon, he and Russell, which is deputy, drove to the Patuxent in response to a call about a jumper. He stood on the bank of the river looking up at the Johnson Bridge. It was a beautiful bridge, and you could see how putting railings or wire fencing along it would mar the pure white arc of it in the air. Last year, when it had been under repair, and people had to use a ferry, there had been a sense of isolation, but also a giddy liberation. The county suddenly severed from the road that went into the bridge's arch in north and east, branching off to the state and national capitals. And there's a chance, Russell asked. Alex looked at the search boat skimming in water spiked circles, circles under the bridge. He peered at the apex of the arch, the point from which the man had jumped. It was marked by three poles topped with red aircraft warning lights. He shrugged. Some survived, two out of six last year. They screwed it up somehow. They're junk. Russell stared at him. It was unbalanced, Alex. Go ahead, he said to Russell. I'll wrap things up. Russell cocked his head. If you were one of your own deputies, you'd be taking a mandatory stand down now, right? Alex. R-H-I-P, Alex. He watched Russell walk slowly away and get into his car, still looking back. He waved once. When the car was gone, Alex started walking up the spine of the bridge. Rising into the air over the river, into an atmosphere tagged to the shore of the earth, but different, full of breezes and touches and whispers. At the apex, he stood looking down at the water. He thought about how it must have been, the jumper standing here, and, yet, and then just stepping out, twisting right off the stem of his life. King Kong, staring at the confusion of sharp angles and lights, the terrible complex symmetry of civilization. The ape couldn't adjust to life in New York, in the world. He couldn't take the jungle out of the gorilla. Alex looked out at the world, trying to imagine his place in it. It's not ours anymore. The line was from a story. Hemingway he couldn't recall the context. Or the line was the context. In the newer version of the King Kong, they had the ape go out to World Trade Center instead of the Empire State Building. King Kong, a college English teacher once told him, had all the attributes of the classic tragic hero. Noble birth, tragic flaw for tiny blondes, fell from a great height. Alex put his right foot up on the low concrete wall, grasped the pole, pulled himself up. He waved back. The deputies beyond the Yellow River barrier smiled at them. Would the apex of an arch bridge over the Patuxent be a great enough height? Would there be a moment of self-discovery before the apes stepped out? Before a climactic splat? Discuss in 500 words the difference between tragic and pathetic. He let go of the pole, tottered for a second, unbalanced. He thought of Kiet, of Louise, as if they were the points in the classic triangle as if he were engaged in a strange infidelity. How could it go on so long? He felt like the last of something, alone up here on this bridge in the first year of the final decade of the blood-soaked century, in the third century of his blood in this place, at the beginning of a war called as if to finally bring his war to an end. Balanced in the usual position between pain and oblivion, he stared down at the wrinkling water pulled a vision out to himself as if he were a Piscataway, as if out of his own dreams, the rotor wash again, parting the rice stalks to reveal the woman he'd once shot. Not a dream, but a flash in the corner of his eye, like a photo suddenly glimpsed in a wink of light. The squat, the wide eyes, the curve of pregnancy, the terror, his obscene ledger de mom. The hand quicker than the eye, quick to pull the trigger, not quick enough to jerk up the barrel. The flash burning her into his brain. Only he didn't think she had been. Not then. She just slipped into the long slide of the war. And weeks later, it took him as if an inevitable progression over a ditch where he hovered and balanced above the murdering with no other comment than a curse. It was what you were supposed to do. She wasn't the first. She won't be the last. He was just a kid. But she'd come back to him, followed him in a girl to the places of his childhood and ancestry and legacy. 
tried to think of the last week now, last night, see clearly what he'd become involved in. But what he saw now, what his mind spun into a truth more real than memory, was the woman grasping her thighs open as she sank, pulling her belly open, her fingers slipping into the bullet holes and yanking apart her flesh, and the newborn, <coughs> never-born baby, bobbing triumphant from the brown water, netted in blood and slime, the baby he yanked out of the world before it was born, a birth pulled out of his pain and need, like the movie massacre Kiet had made into a memory of her own, a construct born of pure need and pure truth, as real now to her as the massacre he hovered over helplessly, as the image that flared his mind now, the way Baxter screamed that flared into memory, the woman's fingers opening, relinquishing as she sank under the brown paddy water, the golden child's face emerging. His heart aching, he could picture Kiet now forming to her image in his mind, as she had formed trembling on the leaves outside his studio window from his clay. And looking down at the vibrant skin of light on the river now, hung balanced over that line at an altitude of 1,500 feet, he saw the water becoming, become a membrane, quivering over the still quivering dead and dying in the ditch. He saw clearly how they hadn't been quite real from his height. The woman he'd shot, the child who crawled from that opening in the earth, born from the dead and flung back to them, they all hadn't been quite real to him then the way a 19-year-old's concept of his own death isn't real to himself. But every year since, like a father watching his child growing into its flesh and form as the father grew into his own adulthood, he had grown as responsible for both dead children, as if they were one living child, as if he casually fathered it when he was 19 and flown on, as if his bullets were seed, and now the child had become real, and had come now into its life, and his life in this place, and had become, out of all the memories and nightmares from which he might have chosen the tag on which he had hung his life, the way in which he would move 